Oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Once again, it's Wednesday evening. It's time for our Wednesday evening Bible study. If you would, please, ma'am, please, sir, get your pens, your papers, and your bags. And we're going to continue to share in Romans chapter 8 as we have been sharing there for the past four weeks. And on this evening, we want to continue to deal with his working for our good on part 5. And we're going to be looking at verse number 34 in Romans chapter 8. Let's have a brief word of prayer and we'll press on this evening. Father God, we thank you for allowing us to come together and to share with one another, one God. We ask, Father God, that you open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we'll be able to receive from you, Lord God. Father, let your word be relevant, let it apply to where we are within our walk with you, Lord God. Let your word, Lord God, enlighten us, strengthen us, and feed us until we want no more, Lord God. Father, pour into us everything that you desire to pour in, Lord God. And Father, we'll ever be so careful to give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Romans chapter 8, and this is part 5. We're looking at tonight, verse 34. Verse 34 said, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, brethren, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Look, it's the, the work of salvation through Jesus Christ. The work of salvation through Jesus Christ is working for our good. And that's basically what verse 34 focuses in on. Uh, there, there, there are really four key points that I want to share with you about this verse. Uh, hopefully it won't take me long to share these four key points with you. And we'll wrap this up and next week we'll go on to uh, the next part in this series. Uh, but Jesus does not condemn us. Uh, and, and, and that gives us the assurance of deliverance that we are not condemned. Um, because you need to think about it for a second. What sense does it make for him to save us than to turn around and to condemn us? But when you look at verse 34, notice how direct and how forceful the question is. Who is he that condemns us? Well, it is Jesus. Only Jesus Christ can condemn us for our sins and shame. But the, new, but the good news is that Christ does not condemn us. On the contrary, the very opposite is true. Four things that I want to share with you about this text, and I want you to see this. And we're going to teach this and, and, and pray for that God will give all, all of us a good understanding so we can apply this to our lives. The first thing that we need to understand about 34 is, is that Christ died for us. Christ died for us. So he's our Savior. When we honestly come to him, he does not condemn us for our sin and shame. He actually forgives us. He's able to forgive us because he died for us. He died for our sins. Our sins are a shame. For sin is open rebellion against God. Sin acts against God. Sin fight and struggles against God. Sin goes against all that God stands for. Sin is insurrection against God. It is the crime of high treason against God. Sin is the most terrible act that can be done against God. Now, we deserve to be condemned by God and put to death for our sins, but we do not have to face that condemnation. Jesus has already paid the penalty and the price for our sins. Jesus has already been condemned and executed for our transgressions against God. And this is the love of Jesus Christ. He has already died for us in our place, in our stead, as our substitute. He did that for you and I. 
when we sincerely come to Christ, he does not condemn us. He loves us and forgives our sins and shame. This is the very purpose of his death, to free us from sin, from the penalty and the condemnation of sin. Look, well, you can go back and, 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 and look at uh, uh, Romans 5 and 6. Well, Romans chapter 5 is a really good chapter that talks about it. Romans 5 and 6 says this. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, which means before we even knew who he was, he had already died and paid the price for us. If you go to that same chapter, drop down to verse number 8, and it says, But God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If that's not enough to help support you, support that principle, go down to verse number 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only that, but if you go over to 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 24, it says, who, who his own self bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. If you go over to chapter 3, you'll see what he said, For Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So literally, he, was, he had no sin and he done no wrong. Look, he died for us. He did that for us. And that's a great assurance that you and I have that he died for us to pay the penalty that we should have. Look, it should have been you and I on the cross, but it was him on the cross in our place. And I'm glad that it was, because I really didn't want to go through that myself, because that's rough. Uh, second thing that I wanted to share with you this evening is this. Christ has been risen from the dead for us. Christ has been risen from the dead for us. Christ is our risen Lord. His resurrection does a couple of things for you and I today. First of all, the, res the resurrection of the Lord proves that God was perfectly satisfied with the death of Jesus Christ. It proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was satisfied with the death of Jesus Christ. What Christ did in dying for our sins was acceptable to God. God has accepted Jesus' death for us. God has approved his dying for us. God's divine justice was perfectly satisfied with Jesus dying for us. This is clearly seen in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if God had not been satisfied, he would have left Jesus in the grave. But thanks be to God, God was satisfied, so he raised up Jesus to live forever as the sovereign savior of the world. All right? So that's the second thing. Let me give you some scriptures to help support this principle. Once again, you go back into Romans chapter 1, verse number, Romans chapter 1, verse number 4. It says this, uh, And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. God raised him from the dead. If you look over to Romans chapter 4, verse 25, and he said, uh, and, and was raised again for our justification. So once again, this part of this resurrection is for you and I. If you go over to 1 Corinthians uh, 15, Paul says, and if Christ be not risen, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. But thanks be to God, that when he got up out of the grave, it was not in vain. You see, the resurrection of the Lord gives us a new life, making us a new creature and a new man. He gets a new life, a new creature. We are a new creature and we are a new man. A new life, a new creature, and a new man. A new life, a new creature, and a new man. To really grasp and get a good understanding of that, you have to go over into Romans chapter 6, and really begin to look at the first I mean, four or five verses in that chapter, which gives a better understanding of this. See, we, 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 when you look at that, we are, 
immersed or placed into or identified with Christ in his resurrection. Now, the same picture of baptism is used in Romans chapter 6 to strike home this truth in our hearts. God counts the true, true baptized believer as having been raised with Christ. God takes our faith and count us as participating in Jesus Christ's resurrection. He counts and he counts and considers that considers us to be raised in Christ's resurrection, to be placed in Christ's resurrection, to be identified with Christ's resurrection, to be a partaker of Christ's resurrection, to be in union with Christ's resurrection to be born with Christ in his resurrection. Jesus was raised up from the dead by the glory of a father. Now, this tells how our glorious position in Christ took place. It happened by the glory and the power of God. Now, the glory, and the, the glory of God means all the excellence of God, all that is in his might and power, love and grace, compassion and mercy. It was the glory of his might and power that raised up Jesus from the dead and it was by the glory of his might and power that he placed and positioned us in Christ. God's purpose for raising, up, raising us up with Christ is demonstrated in, 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 in such a meaningful way. It involves walking in a whole new light. The word walk means to walk about, to walk step by step, to control and order our behavior, to consistently and habitually walk in newness of life as a new creature in Christ. So 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 when we got up, we got up different than what we were. I, I tell you. Think about this for a moment. I want you to think about it. When Jesus died on the cross, he laid aside his old life and left it behind. When he died on the cross, he laid aside his old life and he left it behind. When he rose, he took on a totally new life, a changed life, a resurrected life. It is his new life, his changed life, and resurrected life that is given to you and I. You see, in the Bible, the word new often carries the idea of purification, righteousness, holiness, godliness. Well, so to, when we look at it that way, we receive a new birth. We receive a new birth. You can find that in 1 Peter 1 and 23, also in 1 Peter 2 and 2. We received a new heart. You can find that in Ezekiel 11 and 19, and also in Ezekiel 18 and 31. We become a new creature. You can find that in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, and in Galatians 6 and 15. We become a new man. You can find that in Ephesians 4 and 24, and Colossians, Colossians 3 and 10. So it's there for us. So whether you know it or not, all of us, we are of a new birth, we have a new heart, we are a new creature, and we are a new man all together. God, very purpose, God's very purpose for placing us in the resurrection life of Jesus Christ is that we might walk in Christ, walk soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We put off the old man of sin and put on the new man of righteousness and godliness. We live a pure, clean, and holy life. All right. Third thing that I needed to share with you this evening is this, is that Jesus has been exalted for us. He has been exalted for us. Jesus is our exalted Lord. He sits face to face with God at his right hand. We shall also be exalted into the presence of God. Just as Jesus lived face to face with God, um, we shall also live face to face with God throughout all eternity. Remember, we, we talked about this in uh, uh, in Romans eight and twenty nine, and we also alluded to it in Romans three and twenty three. Remember, 
in order for this to happen, we must conform to the image of God's sons. That's the only way that's going to happen. We have to become a partaker of his divine nature. Second Peter 1 and 4. We, to be, we are adopted as the son of God. We are children of God now. Ephesians 1 and 5. We are to be holy and without blame before him. Ephesians 1 and 4 and also in Ephesians 4 and 24. We are to bear the image of the heavenly, which is an incorruptible, immortal body. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 49 through 54. He talks about that. We are to have one's body fashioned, which means to be conformed, just like his glorious body. That's in Philippians 3 and 21. Uh, we, we are to be changed, in other words, transformed into the same image of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. We are to be recreated just like him. 1 John 3, uh, verse 2 and 3. So, so that's, that's the transformation that's going to take place. The Lord Jesus Christ is exalted as the sovereign and majesty, majestic Lord of the universe. He is the ruler who reigns and rule over all, who possesses all might and power, and is full of all wisdom and truth. He is the one who is going to destroy and ultimately destroy, utterly eliminate sin and evil in this world. He is the one who is going to establish a kingdom of righteousness and justice, love and truth in the new heaven and the new earth. Flip over to Ephesians 1. Let's look at verse 20 and uh, 21 just very briefly. I just want to read it uh, just, just to have it in your hearings. Uh, Ephesians 1, 20 and 21 says this, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the, and that which is called. What is it? Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So all of this took place when he was raised from the dead. When you look at Philippians 2, we talked about that one as well. Philippians 2, verse 9 through 11 says, And wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue should in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So even him now, he is the highly exalted Lord today. At this very present moment, he's highly exalted. And he's going to raise us up, so don't worry about it. It's going to happen. Uh, um, it is Jesus Christ and not another who rules and reigns over the entire universe. Now, this stirs enormous assurance in the hearts of all genuine believers, all genuine converts. Why? Because Jesus Christ has demonstrated his glorious love and care for the world. He not only can, but he will look after us and work all things out for good until he returns for us, i.e. Romans 8, 28. Um, the control of evil in the world and our lives are under the care of Jesus Christ. He is working all things out for good to those of us who truly love him and are called according to his purpose. Ah, Romans 8, 28. Ain't that something? But look, Jesus said this in Matthew 6, verse 31 and verse 33. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added to him. You've got to understand God got this thing fixed. He's got us covered. He's got us taken care of. No matter what's happening in your life right now, God got it fixed. He has you taken care of. Matthew 28 and 20 says, He said, Lo, I am with you always, even until the ends of the earth. Amen? Last thing I wanted to share with you this evening is this. Uh, Jesus makes intercession for us before the throne of God. He is our great intercessor, our mediator, and advocator who stands between God and us. It is Jesus Christ who brings us to God and who makes us who makes redemption even the forgiveness of our sins possible. It is his advocacy, 
his death and resurrection for us that forgives our sins. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says, My little children, these things are written unto you that ye sin not. And if, you, if, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the perpetuation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's our advocate. He stands in between you and God. He's constantly interceding on our part. It is his intercession, the intercession of his death and resurrection for us that saves us. Romans 4 and 28 says, who has delivered for our, who, who was delivered for our offense and was risen again for our justification. So he did this for us in his presence in heaven and his plea, the plea of his death and the resurrection for us that opened the door to heaven for us. The writer of Hebrews 9 and 24 says this, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the fragments of the fragments of the truth, fragments of the truth, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us, so he stands there, he's interceding on our behalf. Secondly, we have the greatest assurance imaginable. We have the greatest assurance imaginable. We shall be delivered from the struggling and sufferings of this world. We shall be delivered from the struggling and sufferings of this world. No matter the sin and shame of our life, if we truly come to Christ, we are not condemned. If we truly come to Christ, we are not condemned. We are not judged for sin, no matter how terrible or how far we have fallen from his grace. He'll be there to help us to get up. If we will only come to Christ, Jesus will deliver us. Jesus will not leave us down and discouraged and defeated. Jesus will not even scorn or reproach us. Jesus will receive his dear children with open arms. Ephesians 1 and 7 says, And whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. 1 John 1 and 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Matthew 11 and 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heaven laden, and I will give you rest. So no matter what's going on in your life, I want you to know that you are not condemned. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus and who walk not after the flesh. As long as you are in Christ, you are not condemned. No one else is qualified to condemn you but Jesus, but Jesus will never condemn you because he went to Calvary and went to the grave just to make sure that you would not be condemned. All right, that's Wednesday evening Bible study. Looking forward to seeing you Friday on Zoom. Invite your friends, your families to come and share with us on Zoom. We want you to like the video. We want you to share the video with others. And, and because our goal is not just to reach the membership, but to reach the entire world. And the more you like and the more you share, the more you'll be able to reach all the others that are around you. Once again, if you're going outside, please wear a mask. Please be safe. Uh, the weather's been pretty rough. Please, you know, if at all possible, continue to stay at home, shelter in place. If you do not have to go out in the world right now, please stay home until all of this bad weather passes us by. Uh, I pray that God will keep you safe during this time and keep his hand up on you. Know that God loves you. Know that God is there with you. Know that he has not abandoned you, that he has not forsaken you. Know that I love you. Know that I'm praying for you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you Friday on soon. Um, now. Father, we thank you for this time you've allowed us to share together, Lord God. We pray that we have blessed each other by sharing with one another. We pray that our lives have increased and have grown as a result of sharing in your word. Father God, we thank you for this time, Lord. Father, as we separate now, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit continue to abide with us forever, Lord God. Rest within our house, within our home. Keep your hand upon us, Lord. Now, Father, we thank you for this time that we have shared with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.